Welcome back to our next lesson, Grade 10 Chemistry, following the Australian Curriculum. I've got a few questions on the screen there. Have a look at it, see if you can uh, pause the video and answer some of those questions. We've got things like, what does valency mean? We spoke about that in the last lesson. How is it different for a metal and a non-metal? Something to do with electrons. See if you can work out the valency of those groups listed there. So we have things like, Earth metals, alkali earth metals. I spoke specifically about those ones last time. Where are they? Halogens, we spoke about them. Noble gases. All right, group 16 and 15, you can find them on there. It's all to do with counting how many extra electrons that we have. The earth metals are often the alkali metals in the first column there. Okay, remember. They had one electron in their outer layer, so have a valency of one, and so on. Here we are in our uh, tr um, scheme. We're moving on a little bit. Keep following as we go. And we've got some more Chuck Norris memes today. So, what is the valency of these groups? Alkali metals. The first one there is group one, so he must have a valency of one. Okay, what that means is, it's going to lose one electron. And that's the important bit, to work out how many it gains or lose, loses. Alkali Earth has two electrons in its outer layer, so it's going to lose two electrons. The halogens over here, ignore the fact that it's 17 and just call it seven. So it has seven electrons in its outer layer. It wants to gain one. If it gains an electron, it gains that negative charge and fills its outer layer. Noble gases. Well, they've already got a full outer layer, so they don't want any more. So they're basically zero. They don't want anything else. They've got eight electrons in their outer layer. And group 16 and 15, that's these guys in here. These have six in their outer layer. These have five. He's going to want to gain two electrons, and this one's going to want to gain three electrons. How do we write that? Like this. So the alkali metals have one electron, they will gain one electron. Alkali Earth will gain two. The halogens uh, have a deficit of one, is an easier way to put it. As in, they've got seven electrons, they want one more, so they have a deficit of one. That's a, probably a, an easier way to think about it. So, I've got a video here for you to look at. I want you to pause this video, go and check that one out, and come back, it's only a short one. A bit over three minutes. What we're effectively talking about here is, if you look at the three examples here of the alcohol uh, metals I've got, lithium has three protons, which you can see in its nucleus there, so it has three electrons. One, two, and then the third one goes in the, the next shell. So two in the first shell, eight thereafter. Sodium has 12. You can see there's two in the first layer. Eight in the next one, and the last one there makes the extra one. Oh, sorry, has 11 protons, I should have said. 12 neutrons. The 11th one sits in that last outer shell. Potassium was the same thing. And the important thing here is not all these electrons in the earlier levels, it's what's in that outer layer, because that's the bit that's going to sort of collide with the atom in that collision theory we spoke about back at the start there. And actually make it react. Right, so the halogens are the other end of the periodic table over near the noble gases. So where the alkali metals are way over that side, the halogens are over this side next to the noble gases. Have a look at this video here and uh, look at how the halogens actually work. All of them are going to have the same scenario. They have seven electrons in their outer layer, they want one more, so they will gain an electron from somewhere else to get that full outer shell of eight electrons and be stable. So how do we get this periodic table? Well, once again, we've got a nice little video here, but it all came down to a Russian guy, a Russian scientist by the name of Mendeleev, Dmitry Mendeleev. He was kind of brilliant because he lived some time ago and only half the elements that we know today were known in his time and Mendeley sort of looked at how scientists were starting to arrange these um, elements 
and nobody had come up with a good system for arranging them. And what Mendeleev thought his brilliant breakthrough was if we look at how these things are reacting and, and what their properties are, we can see if we can group them together. And he noticed that as he started to group together their, um, their the way they reacted and their properties, and then sorted those groups out um, on their uh, atomic mass or their mass number, he started to see a pattern. And that's what formed the periodic table that we have today. That's kind of the short explanation of what happened. But Mendeley was so brilliant, he knew to leave spaces in there because they were the spaces for the elements that hadn't yet been discovered. And that's the thing that he was able to work out before these things were ever actually discovered. And when you kind of look at the groups, those columns of the table and how they react, it kind of makes sense that they should go together in certain uh, patterns. Interactive game for you to have a go at there. I want you to have a crack, crack at that one. Find that um, web link and go for that one. And sort of looking ahead, where does all this lead? It leads to the idea of chemical reactions. So we have lithium and fluorine. Lithium has a valence of one, which means it has one electron in its outer layer. Fluorine has a deficit of one, so we call that negative one. And if you count the electrons in the outer layer, you'll see that there's seven there. So what actually happens here? Everybody wants the outer layer filled. It's very easy for lithium to lose this one, give it to the fluorine. Lithium ends up being positively charged because he lost an electron, so he has a net positive charge. Fluorine gains that electron, how has a net negative charge. The positive atom here and the negative atom here are going to be attracted to each other. And that's what we're shown here. You can see the little red electron transferring across to the fluorine to fill his outer shell and make them both stable. That's essentially how a lot of these common reactions occur. We have a quiz to have a go at. I'll put the uh, link in the uh, description somewhere and you can uh, click on that one and have a go. And that link at the top there is the one that you need to do the quiz for this week. And there is an experiment that you can look at. You can have a pause the video and have a look at those. But what we're looking at is the conservation of mass in a combustion reaction. We have uh, basically a um, sample of steel wool. You can run an electric charge through it and cause it to react. And basically look at the mass of it before and after the reaction. And you should see that it's the same. And what that kind of tells you is that all those reactants that you start with end up as products at the other end. So have a look at those, pause the video as we go. Same with this one, with a slightly different version where we actually burn it. We, we Combustion, where we, we burn the steel wool over a Bunsen burner flame, put a balloon on the end so none of the gas escapes, and it should weigh the same at the end. And there's some results tables that you can fill in and a discussion to do there. Make sure you have a go at all those questions. Now, if you're working at home, what can you do? How can you do these reactions at home? Here's a few alternatives. Try popcorn. Get some pop, a sample of popcorn, preferably loose stuff, but if you've only got the packet stuff, that, that'll still work. Weigh the mass of the popcorn to start with. Just get some kitchen scales or something and weigh the packet before you make the popcorn. Make it react, as in cook it. All right, and you're physically changing the popcorn, exploding it, making it uh, react a bit. There's the reaction that's occurred. Weigh the final product, the final bag at the end, and it should weigh the same as what you started with. Another example down here with a, um, get a plastic drink bottle of some sort, get a small sample of vinegar and baking soda, and a balloon to put over the top. You have to put that balloon over the top there to capture the gases that come off because the vinegar and baking soda are going to react. You should be able to find vinegar in your kitchen, baking soda in your cupboard, um, or bicarb soda might even work. Have a, have a go, see what you've got. Put it all on a set of scales and weigh it at the start. Then pour the vinegar and the baking soda inside the bottle. Put the balloon on and shake it up. Let it react for a little bit and you should start to see that balloon inflate. Weigh your final product and you should end up with the same mass at the end, showing you that everything you started with, the vinegar and baking soda reacted, formed that gas, but you've captured it in the balloon and it still adds to the weight because the gas itself does have weight. All right, have a go at those at home. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.